Welcome to Move Church. Thanks for joining us for this week's message. We pray this message will both move and inspire you to make a decision into an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. This relationship is where you obtain freedom and will help value your purpose and give you the power to engage your world. Now to the message. How are we doing, everybody? We doing all right? Praise God. Amen. So good to be here. So good to be in the house. Let me look into the camera. Can everybody in the house put your hands together and welcome your church family? Watching online, we love you. We love you so much. Amen. Wish you were here. We miss you. Uh, Hey, yesterday you just saw, you heard, uh, yesterday was men's breakfast. uh, And uh, those that were here you will understand and recognize. I think it was just a significant moment. Uh, I, I was just sitting there and just so humbled and honored to be a part of, uh, of such a great church. I saw 50 or 60 men and the, uh, and the guys that's uh, in, that, uh, in that group leading, uh, you know, uh, our men. And, and uh, we, uh, they led us to the cross yesterday. And we, we, we nailed some things to the cross and then, uh, you know, uh, took someone else's card and put it in the fire. I, I just thought, you know, uh, it was just awesome. They set it up so well. Uh, and just to know that we've got men, men of God, we're standing out around the cross, lifting up the name of Jesus in song and singing together, uh, you know, and uh, I, it just thrilled my heart to be a part of that. And uh, we're just glad to be able to, uh, to, to just share, uh, you know, our love with you. If, you. if this is your first time, we're honored to have you. And we just want you to know uh, that that's just a little picture there. There we go uh, of, of yesterday. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, and uh, just glad that I got to be a part of that. You can put it, take that picture down. Hey, I'm going to do something. I'm not supposed to be speaking today, <laughs> but I got sick uh, four or three weeks ago, I guess it was, and, uh, and was not able to finish. I'm going to do something that I would never normally do. Uh, this long after I finished the series, I was supposed to finish the series July the, uh, June the 19th. Uh, But I got sick, and I was unable to be here, and then I was going on vacation for two weeks. So I am going, uh, there's been some that have reached out, hey, pastor, are you going to finish? You said you're going to talk about the end time, and you're going to close that series out. And so I'm going to uh, do that today, and so I'm sorry. I'm a month behind, but here we go. Is that all right, everybody? All right. Uh, Uh, if you missed the, the, the series, we talked four weeks. We began talking about uh, the book of Daniel. And Greg mentioned uh, the book, you know, Daniel. And uh, but we went through and really uh, we, we did not get to the prophetic side of this book. The first six chapters is all about history, right, of, of the nation of Israel. And, uh, you know, up, up to that point, we had not talked about the prophetic side of it. We talked about some cool stories, though, Daniel in the lion's den, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown in the fiery furnace. Uh, there was a lot of uh, cool stuff, the writing, handwriting on the wall. The underlying theme of the whole series, if you missed it, it'll be online and you can check it out uh, on our app as well. But uh, the underlying theme of the series was is how do you live godly in an ungodly culture, right? When, when culture shifts on you, and really what was going on in the nation of Israel, uh, they were in captivity in Babylon. Uh, they, they were not in their homeland. They had been taken captive, and they were confronted with this culture and this position that, that like, they wanted to live for God, but uh, they, they were... Uh, You know, they were uh, confronted with a culture that demanded something totally different. Uh, And so we looked at, I think, a lot of important lessons that, honestly, you need to be aware of. Important lessons that, if you haven't already been faced with, there's things that's coming at you. Culture around us is shifting. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to be aware, uh, um, Chantel and I were talking this week, it's amazing how slow news used to travel and how fast it travels now. Like we, we see it on our phones uh, daily, 
culture is shifting. It's sliding not to God, but away from God, right? And it's very critical as us as believers in 2022 that we know how to live during these seasons and during these times, right? And so if you missed it, go on, uh, uh, you know, pay attention to it uh, if you missed the series. But this second half, and I'm going to uh, wrap the whole six, last six chapters of Daniel. There's only 12 chapters, but the last six have to do with prophet, prophecy, things that, you know, dreams and visions and prophecies that Daniel had, three uh, in all, right? And in these visions and dreams, he saw the future. He saw things that had not yet happened yet, but things that were to come. And so I want to start today, though, I'm not going to start with Daniel. I'm going to go to the New Testament in, in your notes. If you want to follow along, I think it's important. I'm going to say some things today that maybe you need to write some things down. Uh, I'm going to teach a little bit. But Matthew 24, I want to go to the words of Jesus where he is validating Daniel, what he wrote hundreds of years before uh, in these prophecies, right? And so Matthew type, chapter 24, verse 3 says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? Notice the question, right? Because that's the question a lot of us, like everybody wants to know. And I just want to be up front with you and let's right out the gate here and let you know that's something that you're never going to get the answer to. Because Jesus later said, no one will know the hour or the day when all of this is going to come to pass. But what does everybody want to do? Like we focus, everybody likes to speculate, well, I think it's going to be here. I've grown up in church and, you know, my, you know, they sure enough thought that the year 2000, Y2K, my, Jesus was coming. You know what I mean? And, and, and so everybody likes to speculate, but there's a bigger idea that I think, like, rather than knowing the time, they also said, can you show us the sign? Right? And Jesus was like, listen, I'm not, I can't tell you the time, but I can give you some signs. Are these signs? And so following the verse that I'm reading here, the verse is following, he goes into this long explanation and he lists a bunch of signs. And listen, everybody just needs to know zombies, like the walking dead experience is not one of those signs. All right? So if you were looking forward to killing zombies, you know what I mean? That, that's not one of the signs that Jesus said was coming. All right? Just, just figured I'd throw that out there. What's interesting about the list of signs is all of them have been fulfilled in different generations. So every generation thought that they were the generation that was going to see it because one of these signs happened during their generation, right? Here's the reason that they weren't though, right? And this is the reason that it didn't fulfill in their generation. All the generation had these particular signs, but none of them had all the signs fulfilled in the same generation. And can I just help you recognize today, you and I are living in the first generation that can say that that is actually the case. We're the first generation ever where all the signs that Jesus listed are being fulfilled right before our eyes. And I think it's very significant. And I think, honestly, that we need to pay attention as believers, like not just get so consumed in living this life that we forget that there's another life coming. Like, don't get worried about just paying bills and working a job and taking care of uh, uh, bratty kids. And... Amen. 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 Mm-hmm. I got some too. You know what I mean? Yeah. They can all be brats sometimes. But anyway, Matthew 24, Jesus goes on to say, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, and obviously we see the moral decay going on around us. We see it right now. Because of the increase of wickedness, this hit me this week. The love of most. Come on, that's significant, guys. Not the love of some, but because of the wickedness, because of culture changing, the love of most will become 
cold. Like that's disheartening. Like, like there's, there's going to be a whole generation of people who once were loyal to God, who once was following God, who once had a hot love for God. Their first love was so in pursuit of God. There was a, there's going to be a generation of Christians who will begin to say, oh, that's okay. Uh, that's not lo- no longer a sin. That's, you, th- we got to adapt to the culture. And I'm just here to remind you guys, we can't adapt. God never changes. Amen. Amen. God never changes. We change. Culture changes. Culture shifts. God never changes. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Like he's always, cons- he's the only constant and consistent thing that we got in our life. And somebody needs to know today, like if you feel things shifting around you, I can remind you very boldly today, there's only one thing that's got a sure foundation, and that is God never changes. Verse 13, but the one who stands firm to the end, listen guys, that's for us today. The ones that stands firm to the end, they're going to be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Like when all nations have heard about this goodness. And then after all nations have heard about what God and who God is, then the end will come. Like that is the big climax of what we are waiting for. And we're just, in, and let me just tell you today, you and I are the first generation that can say and witness that that is happening and in process like right now. Amen. Chantel and I was on a cruise for our anniversary a few years ago and we were in, uh, you know, I believe it was Panama and we went an hour into a jungle like in these indigenous people, right? And, 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 and well, Mark, how can you say that every nation has heard or is hearing or in the process of hearing. I'm telling you, we show up an hour away from society. I see some some kid on a cell phone, you know what I mean? You go to Ethiopia. (laughs) You go where you wouldn't think there'd be no cell phones. Everybody. When I say everybody, everybody has a cell phone. I'm just telling you. And where we used to have to send missionaries and try to smuggle Bibles in. Now there's an, like, like there is, and I know some of that's still having to go on and it's happening. But man, cell phones, technology, right? Satellites are making it possible that now people have got a Bible school in their pocket. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Like? Uh, in verse 15, so when you see standing, and Jesus went on to say this. I want to highlight one more. When you see standing in the holy place, right? And that holy place is referencing the temple in Jerusalem. When you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation. Well, Mark, what in the world does that mean? That is a phrase right out of the book of Daniel. A period of time that's coming during the seven years of tribulation, at the end, during the end times, in the middle of those seven years, the Antichrist, somebody that's living on this earth, is going to rise up and become the Antichrist. He's going to put a statue of himself in the temple of Jerusalem. And that is known as the abomination that causes def- desolation, right? It's called the abomination of desol- desolation. Spoken of through the prophet Daniel. Here he is putting confirmation on Daniel as a prophet here, let the reader understand, right? Now listen, it's hard for the reader to understand. It's hard for Pastor Mark to understand a lot of this prophecy stuff. Daniel and Revelation, like it's complicated and it's hard. And like I had to get some help on this stuff because it's hard to understand. Like how many loves reading the book of Revelation? <laughs> not, not me. Because it's hard. <laughs> It's hard, right? And so here's my gift to you. Like, I am going to make the complicated stuff as simple as I can today. Like, I'm going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, all right? Because that's the only way I can understand it, all right? And so here's the goal. I'm going to reduce it down. Like, you can study in depth if you want, and there's some that likes to go deep. This is about as deep as your pastor can get. You know what I mean? All right? And I'm I'm going to give you a few key things 
so you will understand a little better about the end times and what's going to take place so that you can be aware. And then I'm going to give a few takeaways and then we'll close it up. Right? Listen, knowledge is not important if it doesn't change your life. Knowledge isn't important. And so here's how it's going to go. I'm going to get a little technical. We'll get a little heavy on scripture here, just walking you through it. And then I'm going to give you some application. There is one place in the book of Daniel where he summarizes the visions and dreams that he has. And if, you're, if you have the notes, if you got them when you walked in, the way that he explained it was the 77s. Have you ever heard that? Time period, seven years, 70 of sevens, 70 times seven, periods of seven years, right? He saw 490 years of prophecy, of future events that had not yet happened. And before you get ahead of me, most of it has already been fulfilled, okay? And you're, gonna, you're about to find it out. Like he breaks them down for us, and I want to do that. Daniel chapter 9, in your notes, on the screen, verse 24, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. Well, Mark, I don't understand. I'm going to try to help you explain today, all right? From the time the word goes out, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Like when he's writing this, he had no clue of how and when they were going to be able. They were in captivity. They were in a foreign land. He had no idea when they were going to go back, be able to go back to their homeland, back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. He had no clue. But they finally did. Nehemiah and Ezra, right? They record that in your Bible. And actually, those two books, if your Bible was written in chronological order, they should be the last two books of your Old Testament, right? Because they finally went back. And until the anointed one, notice there, it has a capital A. Like he saw Jesus, right? Until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens, which is 49 years, and 62 sevens, which is 434 years. Let me break that down for you. He said, I see a 49-year period, right? Now, if, you're, if you like history, guess how long it took for them to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple? 49 years. We got some smart people here. We got some Bible. We're going to all be Bible scholars before we leave here today, all right? 49 years. Seven times seven. 49 years. All right? He also saw 62 sevens. Are you following me? If you multiply that, that's 434 years. Exactly to the date that Jesus, our Savior, died for us on the cross. Okay? You add those up, that's 483 years has already been fulfilled exactly to the date from that moment is when Jesus died. So 483 years, like he saw it all. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after the 62 sevens, 49 plus 434, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. So he's prophesying Jesus is going to die. The people of the ruler who, and this prophecy was hundreds of years before, who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So in 70 AD, after Jesus had died, 70 AD after death, they came in and what? Destroyed again the temple that had been rebuilt that they were worshiping in, right? The end will come like a flood, all right? So there's seven years that's missing, and I think it's significant. 69 of the 70 years that are 77s that he saw are already fulfilled. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will, who is he? It's the Antichrist. 
Now, many people have tried to speculate who the Antichrist is. In fact, I heard some religious leader the other day saying, or some, I read some report that Boris Johnson uh, in, in the UK was, uh, was going to be the, uh, the, the, the Antichrist. Well, guess what? Two days later, he, he resigned. You know what I mean? Or he is resigning, right? So I don't think Boris Johnson's him, all right? All right? <laughs> all right? He will, he, the Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant. Like he's going to go to Jerusalem, and if we were to put modern terminology on it, he's going to go and broker a peace deal with, with Israel. Because listen, all the Israelites have ever wanted from the time that their tabernacle was destroyed, all that they've ever wanted is to build their temple again, to be able to reinstitute blood sacrifice and be able to sacrifice, reinstitute what they did in the Old Testament. That's all they want. They just want peace, right? With many of, for one seven, the missing seven, in the middle of the seven, three and a half years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So he's going to come in looking like, I'm the man, I'm the guy. And then in the middle, after he's convinced them, they've signed the treaty, the peace. And how many knows? We hear all the time, peace deals trying to be the Palestinians, bringing the Palestinians and the Jews together. We got to bring them together. It's got to be peace. Are you following me, somebody? Think about what we hear in our national news and international news all, all, constantly. Uh, it, they're, they're, they're so divided with many. So he's going to come in the middle of that seven years, and he is going to say, nope, stop the sacrifice, no more. And he's going to set a statue of himself up in the tem temple. <clears throat> Until the end, that is decreed, is poured out on him. All right? So, wow. Everybody, you're a Bible scholar now? You got all that? Let's pray and go home, all right? No, I'm just kidding, all right? I can't leave you hanging like that, all right? So what does all of that mean? Like, what does it mean, right? Like, uh, let me summarize it. Seventy sevens, 490 years. 483 have already been fulfilled. 49 years it took to rebuild the temple. 434 years it took from the temple being built to Jesus dying on the cross. Seven years is unfulfilled, is yet to happen. And that's the part that I think that you and I should think is most interesting because Jesus talked about it, Paul talked about it, uh, you know, Peter talked about it, John in Revelation talked about it. And I just want to give you a summation of, uh, because listen, if you're like me, you read the Bible, and man, the book of Revelation, like, it is just, my, it's, it's so much, Right? Like, and that's why a lot of us, we, we steer clear of the book of Revelation because we just don't understand. And so I want to very quickly give you, if you, you can really take the book of Revelation and, and really sum it down to 10 events. And if you want to take notes, you can take notes. I'm going to give it to you very quickly because my time is running out. Hang in there. We're almost done. All right. There's 10 events that's going to happen that the book of Revelation says that is coming that we need to be aware of. Number one. The church age, Revelations 2 through 3. If you're taking notes, that is the church age. It talks about that. In fact, the first chapter of Revelation, Jesus is talking about, he's given seven warnings to the churches. And he said, these are the things that you need to be doing in preparation as you wait. And so we're living in the church age like right now, right? We're in that age. And you can check them out later. Number two, the second event is the rapture. All right, Revelations 4, verse 1. There is going to be a snatching away of the church. Like Jesus is going to come and snatch us and take us away. Amen. A lot of people don't believe that there's going to be a rapture. Like, and, and I'm okay with that, right? Some say that there's not going to be a rapture. Christians are going to have to go through the seven years of tribulation and all of that. That's fine if you believe that, but I'm getting out of here on the first elevator. You know what I mean? I'm going on the first elevator. The elevator, you know what I mean? I'm out. And what's, what's, what's interesting, Revelation 4 and 1 is the last time that the word church is ever mentioned in Revelation. Well, why is that? Like you leading up to 1, 2, 3, chapters 3, and then Revelation 4, 1, like it's church, 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 church. And now after 4, 1, 
that ain't no mention of church. Why? Because I think the church ain't here no longer. I think the church is gone. Right? Here's the third event. The rise of the Antichrist. Revelation 6. Like this is the part that Daniel saw. Like he saw a person who's going to come and broker this peace deal. Bring the, Is- the, the Israelis and the Palestinians together. Sign a peace deal. Let them rebuild the temple that they've been wanting to build for a long time. Like he's going to show up and say, I'm the man. And he's going to lure everybody in. He's going to bring with him the mark of the beast. And we've all heard about the mark of the beast. And he's going to bring that with him. Right? And, 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 and then as, as the treaty is being signed, like, right, like, like when the treaty is signed, that is going to be the start of the seven year of tribulation. When that treaty is signed. Here's the fourth event. The tribulation itself. Takes up the biggest part of Revelation. Starts at chapter 6 and goes through chapter 19. By the way, let me just tell you. If you don't believe what I'm talking about, you go and study it and do a little search. And you'll find that all the pieces of furniture that was in the Old, like, like that was in the old Testament that, that the Jews uh, you know, uh, worshipped and had in their temple, it's already built. It's in, an, it's in a warehouse somewhere in Israel like right now. Like everything, they're just waiting for the understanding and for the clear sign for somebody to sign a peace deal because they're just in the, you know, they think that they want to build their temple where the original temple was built. The Palestinians don't want that. And, and, and the conflict comes from is, the, is Abraham messed up. And when Abraham messed up and he got ahead of God, like, you know what I mean? Ishmael's. Descendants went this way. Come on, somebody. Isaacs went the other. And that's why we have this divide. And so they get, once they sign this peace deal and they are allowed to build their temple, like everything is already prepared. You can read about it. And all the preliminary things are in, in place like right now. But once that peace deal is signed, the seven years of tribulation period begins. All right? Most of of Revelation 6 through 19 is all about these seven years. So I'm just going to reduce it down. What is those seven years? Seven years of tribulation is going to be a very difficult time on this earth. It's going to be God judging the earth. People will be saved during that time period. But it's going to be very, very difficult. The fifth event, I got to hurry, is the second coming of Christ. All right? The second coming of Christ. The Bible says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. He's coming back. No, number, number six, the marriage supper. I got to run through this. The marriage supper of the Lamb. All right? The first thing he's going to do after he comes back, after the tribulation, is he's going to bind Satan. And he's going to take the Antichrist and the false teacher and the false prophet. And he's going to put them in a bottomless pit. And he's not going to put wings on you. And you ain't going to be floating around like a little fat cherub. You know what I mean? Like all those things that we think is going to happen. No, that ain't going to happen. You know what's going to, what's going to happen? He's going to throw a party. He's going to have a party. Right? That's happening. The marriage supper of the Lamb, seventh event. The millennium. And this is a part that people, this is Revelations 20 and 6. It's hard for a lot of people. It's hard for me to wrap my head around uh, this one. But there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ, not in heaven, on earth. Amen. Not in heaven, on earth. And some are like, like, like I, I don't know if I want Jesus to come back. I like the earth like it is right now. Guess what? You're not going to be on another planet. You're going to be on earth with him as your king for a thousand years. And check it out. Satan is bound. There's not going to be no sin. (laughs) Come on. There ain't going to be no traffic on I-95. Come on, somebody. The hot light at Krispy Kreme is always going to be on. Chick-fil-A is going to be open on Sundays. Come on, I'm just trying to. All right, Thousand year reign. 
The eighth event in Revelation, I'm, I'm trying to make this simplified for you, the last rebellion. For, I, I don't understand it and I don't know why, but as the, at the end of that thousand year, God, Jesus is going to release Satan for just a short period of time. I don't understand why. We know it is the last rebellion. One more time, he will test the earth. One more, and then the ninth is the great white throne judgment. Revelations 20, 11 through 15, of which you as Christians will not be a part of. The great white throne judgment, this is going to be a time where people are going to be judged. They're going to stand before God and they're going to stand. It's going to like, like they're going to be in court and they're going to be judged for how they live their life. And then the 10th event is eternity. Amen. Revelations 21 and 22, last two chapters talk about eternity. It's not going to be here. The Bible says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And, it, and, and, and old things are going to, it, it's going to be gone. And it's going to be a new, like he's going to put it back to how he had Adam and Eve in the garden. It's going to be peace. Animals are no dominant instinct. Lions and lambs will be able to lay together, right? Heaven is going to be fabulous. And you're going to be there to be a part of it, to be a part of it. So I just reduced Daniel and Revelation <laughs> down for you right there. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Daniel 12 says, at that time, Michael, the angel that's in charge of war, answering prayers, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Come on, that's, that's why I believe in the rapture. We're, gonna, we're not going to be a part of the distress that's happening during the tribulation. That's how I believe. But listen, guess what? We can agree to disagree. There's some here today that might think that, you know, I, I'm pre-trib. You might be mid-trib. You might be post. You might think that we're going through. But that's the beauty of, of, of being able to, to walk together. We can agree to disagree because I don't know and you don't know. You know what I mean? But I just want to be ready. I just want to live my life with my eyes. Look to the hills from, from where he's coming. Are you hearing me, somebody? <clears throat> and so I just, I, I just want to close, give you a... If you, Daniel 12, 8, I got a lot more, but I got to close. I got to wrap it up. It said, I heard what he said. Daniel said, I heard what he said, but I didn't understand what he meant. You know? Come on, so that's a refrigerator verse right there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And we tried to simplify and break this thing down just to, to help you as we wrap this series up. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In other words, you won't be able to predict it. Like if you could predict it when the thief was going to break in, you'd know exactly when he's coming. It's going to be like a thief in the night. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Verse 12, as you look forward to the day of God and speed, it's coming. I want to give you three things very quickly. If you're taking notes, write them down. Three things in summary. Follow God, not culture. Follow God. Like culture changes, God never changes. Culture is going to change more and it's going to happen. It's going to get worse than it is today. My question to you as we wrap this message up today, are you going to change with it? Are you going to change with what's going on happening around you? Like if you change with it, you are not a part of who God says. God says, I'm looking for those that's wise, those that's prepared, those that's waiting. Number two, be ready for Christ's return. Like just be ready. You got to be ready. Like I personally believe that we are the closest, gener like we're the generation, we're in that generation that is seeing the fulfillment of the signs. And like a thief, he's going to come. Like a thief, he's coming. 
Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And I just trust that the Holy Spirit is drawing at someone's heart. Like if you're not, if you're not prepared, if you're not ready, like there's a wedding that's coming. There's a wedding. Are you prepared for the wedding? Like Jesus is coming back for his bride. That's really what this whole series was about that we started back in, in May. Like, 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 be ready because he's coming back. Like you're 70, 80, 90 years, however long you have on this earth. Like this is just the beginning. This is just your beginning. And then the last thing is make the most of this life. Understand that you are the generation. Like the, we are, we have an awesome opportunity to experience everything. We live in the greatest country on planet Earth. Amen. We have everything at our fingertips. But that's not what it's all about. Those are just extra blessings. Amen. The thing is, is to know that I know Christ. Would you stand to your feet today? Every head bowed. Father, I just pray today, God, that we would prepare ourselves for the wedding. God, I just pray that the Holy Spirit, as he's moving right now, Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that we would prepare ourselves, that we would not be so caught up in the culture that surrounds us, into the demands that is constantly being forced upon us but that we could stop and recognize and understand that there's a wedding day coming, that you are the bridegroom. You are the groom and we are the bride. Now let us prepare. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here under the sound of my voice, if you're watching online, I just wonder today if you're here and you can just testify to the fact, Pastor, I'm not ready. I'm not ready ready I need to be if the Holy Spirit is convicting you right now he's telling you give your life surrender your life to God there's no one looking around I'm not here to embarrass anyone but right where you stand if that's you if you need to make decisions today for, if you need to make a decision to come back to God would you just raise your hand Pastor Mark wants to lead you in a prayer today I want to pray over you Come on, if, the, if, if, the, if you're here today, God bless you. If there's anybody, I need to make a decision today. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. As our prayer team comes to the front, I'm going to pray. And if you just made a decision today, let's pray this prayer. Everybody repeat after me. Jesus, forgive me for going my own way and living my own life. Today, I surrender everything to you I turn from this culture and I turn to you I give you everything take my heart my soul my mind my strength everything is yours forgive me of all my sins change me from the inside out I want to live for you I want to serve you I want to follow you in Jesus name Everybody says, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Come on, we're going to close in song. Our team is here. If you need to come and pray with someone, if you just have something that I encourage you, don't leave the same way you came. We're here to encourage with you, walk with you, pray with you. Come on, our prayer team is here. God bless you. Thanks for coming.